turn gears now to Father Chris Kappas. Um, I've expanded a little bit, as you see with the quotations this morning, because Dr. Fleischman canceled. So originally, of course, I had prepared a 20-minute talk. I think with the citations, you'll get your money's worth now. <laughs> Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, fill in a little bit of that time and, and derive a little bit more benefit by engaging primary texts. Like most of you, I, I now feel like I can talk a little bit about my own experience as I begin with Father Peter is I didn't know anything about Scotism and um, I didn't really have him on the radar even after I read Copleston's uh, History of Philosophy, but I met Father Peter at Bloomington when he was assigned there. and. Um, I kept hearing about this Scotus fellow, and um, it didn't really sink into me until I went to uh, Italy to study and figured out that for some reason I just didn't know why the system of Thomism, I studied uh, at the Angelicum with excellent Dominican professors who, who were really a godsend, but I just didn't get it. So I began to father transfer to Italy, and I just sat at his feet, and the percentage of understanding anything that he said would go up about every time that I would come and visit. So it was, you know, started about 5% and then I'd go read a bunch of stuff that I could remember and then it would get up to 10 or 15 and then finally I could figure out that he was discoursing about things that were related when I thought he was never answering my questions. <laughs> and eventually I got to the point where it just, at least for the most part, made sense, at least to me. And uh, the, the fruit of our working together um, is a preface that he published recently with Academy of the Immaculate on uh, the Eastern version, I would call it the Immaculate Conception, which I draw your attention to. Um, I, the, the, although he here only writes the preface, in reality this is just a dialogue between Father Peter and I on Marian sources. I mean, you, it won't come out in the text, but it's essentially a dialogue. Uh, I spent more time dialoguing with Father Peter on this study than I ever did on my doctoral dissertation. So uh, I think it's a fruit of him telling me everything I should read in the Western tradition uh, in order to put it in dialogue with the Eastern tradition. So I'll be addressing not this today, but this will be the, the springboard uh, for addressing the Western tradition's adoption of the Eastern tradition. So I'm going to start out this morning by reading a, a citation from Pope Benedict. Uh, I suppose part of the magisterium since it was a formal address. And uh, he said in 2007 at a, a, a public allocution, Mary who gave human nature to Christ is true mother of God and in view of her highest mission was pre-purified as if a distant prelude of the Immaculate Conception. He's talking about the doctrine of St. Gregory Nazianzen here. He foresaw or he studied something that told him that pre-purification was the ancient version in, for all intents and purposes of the Immaculate Conception. And the exploration then in this book is more or less inspired by the same thing in the dialogue between Father Peter and I. So I'll begin with an encomium basically of Father Peter's theological approach and then we'll jump into the texts. I'm very grateful to Father Peter and his behind-the-scenes work leading to the definitive discovery, as, as far as I'm concerned, of the Immaculate Conception within the Byzantine tradition. Today I present further evidence for the historical and theological narrative for which Father Peter wrote a preface just last year, namely in this book. In addition to Greek writers that are contained in the book, uh, the, the results of our dialogue, I argue that Latin's also borrowed from the Greek originate doctrine of Mary's pre-purification, as we'll see through Rufinus's translations of Nazianzen, which I believe found themselves plausibly in Augustine of Hippo, from Theodore, St. Theodore of Canterbury, through Ephraim Gracus, if you know who he is, in Edelfons of Toledo, and Venerable Bede through Maximus, at least virtually in Lateran 649. And the tradition, all of these are a tradition culminating in Pascasius Radbertus, known more for the Eucharist, in his De Partu Virginis in the ninth century. Fellner aided my original Greek investigation from the optic of his perennial metaphysics. 
Although sensitive to the historicity of dogmas, Fellner embraces a real and historical inseparability between metaphysics and theology. Each constitutes the very foundation, ex parte objecti, of biblical claims to revelation. The very notion of salvation for a believer is radically dependent upon a metaphysical world whose cause or origin uh, is revealed in our theology. Tempered with piety of the seraphic doctor, Fellner's convictions flow from the steely logic of the subtle and thus Marian doctor, blessed John Duns Scotus. Fellner's analyses dispense with the decorative chaff that too often constitutes the normal diet of theological pablum, such that he founds our theology on the vocation of man as imago dei. The human mind's similitude to the divine grants to each instantiation of humanity, ipso facto, the potential to participate in divine life. The corollary of this theological axiom leads to the realization that each person possesses intrinsic rationality so as to put on the mind of Christ and, to this extent, to form a theology de necessariis and de contingentibus, the latter of which leads to the primacy of the Incarnation and to the derivative vocation of the Theotokos. In the incar if the Incarnation functions as the mind cause for God's creation, the Theotokos or Dei Para provides the perfect means to decipher the contingent ordering of the universe. Fellner's approach does not threaten but explains the historical via the metaphysical, which serves as the primordial tool of the genuine homo sapiens. Contrary to historical theologies, often homo erectus, hunter-gatherer culture, Fellner provides intellectual tools for planting and reaping intellectual fruit. For homo sapiens sapiens understands the abstract nature of fields, seeds, and seasons a far cry from the subsistence culture of scholars who claim dainties or who collect dainties scattered about the vast olden field of theology. The first part I'll uh, call Fellner and the Immaculata in Byzantium. Treating the Immaculate Conception, Fellner avoids physicalist reductions to Mary's conception in utero. Scotus's insights uh, focus, focus on the absolute primacy of Christ as the mind cause, the first contingent thought selected out for, actual, for the actual contingent order in the divine mind to initiate the history of the universe. For Fellner, as for the Franciscan school, Immaculate Conception is a catchphrase for signifying Mary as the sign for us or contingent fact that betrays a godly plan of the absolute primacy of Christ. Mary's conception, her birth, presentation, and other mysteries can be understood under the ages of the Incarnation. Each liturgical and historical, I call liturgico-historical moment of Mary's life until the Incarnation is simply a pre-incarnational moment of grace and glory that anticipates the centrality or the central moment in the history of salvation, which is, of course, the Incarnation. Hence, since a negation or a privation does not exist in a positively to determined contingent world, uh, in a, at least uh, according to the first plane of predestination, then we begin to see unfold uh, the implications of the Immaculate Conception. All positive predestination of creatures is a, also a Maximian, meaning Maximus the Confessor notion, which Byzantine authors too adopted in Metaphysics of Predestination in the second millennium, especially in the school of Gregory Palamas, who died in 1357, culminating in Mark of Ephesus, who died in 1445. For Mark of Ephesus, Maximus's sense of predestination of Mary and the saints could only mean a dispensation whereby a predetermined series of graces were simply selected out in the divine mind to ensure glorious salvific figures in history. Fellner explicitly refers in his writings to Maximus the Confessor, Confessor as having in this regard a synoptic metaphysics with the Bonaventuro Scotistic School. Fellner exploits an oft ignored source for Maximus's theology, namely Lateran Council 649, which is the prelude 
to Constantinople III and Ecumenical Council in 680. Fellner's metaphysical Mariology, denoted Metaphysica Mariana Quedam, has served as my own gauge for the nuts and bolts of metaphysics a la Byzantine. If SCOTUS did not develop all corollaries that flow from Christological primacy, the Franciscan school, for example, Francis of Mayrone, was quick to do so, as Fellner emphasizes repeatedly, through a series of comparisons and contrasts among Byzantine Palamite and Franciscan theologies, the meaning behind Mary's pre-purification, formerly a mystery, at her all, her all holy conception and annunciation in Byzantine literature manifested itself effortlessly in the recent monograph upon which we worked. Part two, the pre-purification or the purified version in Byzantium. Gregory Nazianzen grappled with Jesus and Mary's purification in the temple. In the Greek, uh, uh, opposed to the Vulgate, it's both of them are purified in the temple. Nazianzen suggested a miniature Copernican revolution in theological terminology. We normally use purification to clean something soiled, but Nazianzen prioritizes Christ's experiences as the primary human experience of being purified. Hence, whether in the temple or at his baptism, Nazianzen takes the dove's eye view of purification. I'll ask you to go to number one uh, in your texts in the Greek East, labeled number one. Here's what Nazianzen has to say about Jesus' baptism. You may recognize this from the preface that we say for the baptism of Jesus. So then, a little later, you will see, too, Jesus purified in place of my purification in the Jordan. But better, he was making holy the waters by purification, for indeed he was in, need, he was in no need of purification, since he is the one taking away the sin of the world. So the idea here is that we admit that Jesus is purified, but its meaning is equivocal to what our kinds of, uh, the kinds of purification that you and I undergo. The Spirit descends not to take away sin, but to add grace and to testify to predestined glory. Jesus and Mary were conjointly purified within the temple in Luke 2, 48, which was a manifestation of grace and glory according to the capacities of their human natures. Nazianzen unquestionably defines purification in unconditionally positive terms in Christology and Mariology, though it holds an equivocal definition in human baptism for sins. Nazianzen's Christological sense of purification was so clear that Byzantine tradition unanimously affirmed thereafter its all positive sense until confusion was rout only in the 14th century in Byzantium, following Dominican debates on the subject of Mary's purification as introduced by items such as the Summa Theologiae. Of course, we're talking about, uh, I think it's somewhere around book, uh, par, uh, Pars Tertia 27 and 28. This is the first signs of any sense in which pre-purification, which is the Latin scholastic understanding of it um, since uh, the discussions in the uh, 12th and the 13th century, uh, that it could be something negative, that it would be purification from sin. The Christological sense was primary in Byzantium until the introduction of, of the Summa Theologiae. This was alluded to by Nicholas Cavasilas. If you go to number eight, you'll see that Nicholas Cavasilas here says, if there are some of the holy doctors who say that the virgin is pre-purified by the Spirit, then it is yet necessary to think that purification i.e. an addition of graces, is intended by these authors. And these doctors say this in the way the angels are purified with respect to whom there is nothing knavish. He's responding to these recent theologians who were claiming that somehow the purification of Mary was a negative attribute, and those were the Dominicans whom he debated in Thessalonica. Defending Nazianzen's sense of purification, pro-Palamite authors found themselves making apologies against recent naysayers. Gregory Palamas himself never lost sight of this sense of purification that was handed down by Nazianzen. He died in 1357. We saw Nazianzen, but also Nazianzen was picked up by Sophronius of Jerusalem. Why don't we go to him at number three? What does pre-purification mean as a term for him? 
three, number 3A, three nobody is blessed as you, nobody is sanctified as you, nobody is magnified as you, nobody is pre-purified as you, nobody is beaming as you, nobody is brilliant as you. The Holy Spirit comes down upon you, the stainless woman. It is going to make you more pure, and it is going to provide for you a fructiferous power. Speaking of the Annunciation. And then finally, we see that the culmination of the Eastern tradition in the first millennium is in number five, which is John Damascene. John Damascene in number five says, O oh, August Immaculate, I will thoroughly describe the infinite power of the Most High which overshadowed thee, Luke 135, after the Holy Spirit came upon thee, who had been hallowed with respect to soul and pre-purified with respect to body. And then uh, also others. I just provide for fun. Nicephorus of Constantinople. You can read that one on your own. Let's go then to Palamas and number seven and see what the second millennium in Byzantium augurs with the pre purified and its definition. The mother of God possessed a great joy. She understood the matters from the angel. This is at the resurrection at the tomb. The matters from the angel and became full of light just as she was utterly purified and divinely filled with grace, and she too was one who knew absolutely certainly the truth, and she believed in the angel. The resurrection was the moment in which Mary was the first witness because of her pre-purification at the Annunciation. In fact, every liturgical mystery for the Palamite school is a moment of pre-purification, including the conception of Mary. Finally, we look at Mark of Ephesus, the culmination of the Eastern tradition in 1440, who died in 1445. Here's his doctrine in summary. I could have given you more, but I just wanted to give you an excerpt. But he did so, Jesus did so with her after he pre-purified her through a most profuse grace by means of the protecting Holy Spirit and divine power. Palamas' spiritual disciple, Mark of Ephesus, devoutly followed his master, Palamas, wherefore Mark applied the sense of predestination in the divine mind to Mary's role in the economy of salvation, while supposing Maximus' sense, uh, the confessor's sense, of the primacy of the incarnation and its link to the Theotokos. Palamites expanded Nazianzen's notion of Mary's pre-purification at the Annunciation as paradigmatic for understanding the Spirit's operation upon Mary in other historical liturgical feasts. So whereas the first millennium only basically supplied pre-purification as what happens at Mary at the Annunciation, Palamites started saying what happens at the, at the presentation of the temple. Oh, it also happens at, uh, uh, at her birthday. Oh, it also happens at her conception. And all pre-purification is the adding of graces to a nature which is already pure because Christ is the first purified, purified in baptism and purified in the temple. Mary, unlike Jesus, was called pre-purified before the historical liturgical event of the Annunciation. Hence, pre-incarnational Marian feasts of the Byzantine calendar, namely the conception, birth, and presentation, rank as pre-moments, pre-purification, whereas post-incarnational moments of grace and glory are univocally designated purification for both Jesus and Mary. Palamites saw the plan of Mary's grace and glory as pre-selected along with the incarnate Christ prior to time and creation of the contingent order. The Theotokos, as the highest purely contingent thought in the eternal mind, was antecedent in order to any actually created being. The sovereignty of Christ remained, remains unthreatened in their theology since Theotokos derives its very meaning from the fact that Mary bore the incarnate word. Number three, this is the new part. The pre-purified virgin in the West, namely Augustine. I now wish to trace new evidence for the pre-purified virgin's literary pilgrimage into the Latin West. And surprisingly, Augustine serves as a point of departure for Greco-Latin Mariology. First, Augustine bowed in reverent silence, famously, refraining from affirming any ethical sinfulness in Mary. Still, Augustine seems to imply, perhaps, that Mary was somehow caught up in the sinful inheritance of Adam, the inevitable result of a strict application of traducianism. Augustine saw physical conception as the bearer of a physico-ethical original sin. Yet, did Augustine know about the Greek doctrine of the pre-purified virgin? Recent studies support my claims uh, contextually and circumstantially that, indeed, he could have. 
and I believe that we can at least argue that it's plausible, uh, that he knew the pre-purified Mary. Augustine does not explicitly mention the Greek notion of Marian pre-purification, but a relevant passage which Augustine wrote around 411 or 12, if you go to 10a, number 10a, begins declaring Jesus' flesh as clean from the flesh of sin. Augustine then speculates about Mary's flesh at what point? Strangely, at the Annunciation. I'm going to select out the bold quotes here. Hence, what was of flesh, which Jesus certainly took up, he either actually cleansed what needed to be taken up, or he cleansed it by virtue of taking it up. Therefore, how much has flesh of sin been baptized due to divine judgment that must be avoided if flesh without sin has been baptized due to imitation's prototype? The theme of Mary's purification linked with the Annunciation was first known and exegeted in Nazianzen's Paschal and, Theo and Theophany or orations. So far as I know, no prior Greek or Latin works are known to advocate both Mary's pur purification and Jesus' prototypical baptism of cleansing together in one spot. Augustine seems to do both here. One homily attributed to Ephraim the Syrian, or Ephraim Gracus, from the 5th century, does mention the motif of Nazianzen's purification of Mary at the Annunciation, but I have found no trace of Jesus' baptism or prototypical baptism. Augustine's coincidence with Nazianzen becomes nearly a case of certain dependence, as far as I can tell, when we look at, what's, at the many scholars who have more recently cataloged Augustine's multiple references to Nazianzen, he refers to having read him himself. But satisfactory evidence also records Augustine's own citations of Nazianzen via the translations of Rufinus. Or Rufinus. Uh, so Nazianzen Latinus, uh, probably around 398-399. Therein, Augustine would have read a Rufinus rendering of Nazianzen. So, we just read Nazianzen's pre-purification in Greek, right? Uh, let's take a look at it. In every way, uh, if we look at number one, in every way, Jesus also is become man, save sin, for he had been conceived from the virgin after she had been pre-purified in soul and body, through the Holy Spirit. For it was necessary that his birth be honored and virginity be previously honored to that. Now listen to Rufinus Latinus, which is also present there if you see number... <coughs> if you, the Latin translation is C, number 1C. Here's what Rufinus translates that as, and I say quite accurately. In every way, he also has become man save sin. He was brought forth from a virgin herself too, immaculate in soul and body through the Holy Spirit. For it was necessary indeed that birth of a human creation be honored, yet it was necessary that the glory of virginity be previously more highly honored. You see that every single word is almost the same except for pre-purified. Rufinus understood the Greek terminology of the time, which is accurately immaculate is the same as pre-purified. Rufinus's translation of pro catharthesa is accurate. The Latin translation perfectly conveyed Nazianzen's theological point that Mary's whole body and whole soul had been immaculate at the Annunciation. Augustine perhaps reflected on Mary's fleshly status at the Annunciation through Rufinus when composing his Antipelagian De Peccatorum Meritis et Remissione. If you go to 10a, we'll see that citation. 10a. And that's what we just read. Uncanny designation of Jesus' prototypical baptism coupled with a purification of Mary's flesh at the Annunciation betokens reliance upon Nazianzen's doctrine. Yet Augustine failed to emphasize Mary's all holiness of body and soul at the Annunciation, perhaps betraying a misunderstanding of pur purification in Nazianzen, or perhaps a, because he had a preferential option to ignore it, at the onset of the Pelagian controversy. Hence, Augustine's ethico-physical convictions about sinful human flesh and inherited guilt, when preoccupied about Pelagian emphasis of humanity's collectively sinless nature, 
might have tempted him to exclude wholesale purity of Mary from her physical conception onward. Augustine appeared to affirm that the portion of Mary's flesh employed by Christ at the Annunciation was purified when taken up to make Jesus in utero. Did he understand Nazianzen's sense of purification? He appears to prefer the lexical sense versus the Greco-theological sense of the term. Consequently, Mary was left with Adamite flesh through uh, at her own natural conception, at least as far as I can tell. Augustine was perhaps at pains to adopt Nazianzen's exception to avoid nullifying the law of infection of the flesh from human copulation. A few years later, Augustine affirmed around 415 in De Natura et Gratia, if you look at 10b, he says to a uh, Pelagian is claiming uh, that a Pelagian also adjoins women without sin, saying of them, even the very mother of our Savior and Lord, about whom it is necessary to confess in piety, was without sin. Uh, since the Holy Virgin Mary had also been excluded in just this manner, I wish absolutely nothing at all to be related to her when in the, treating the question of sins. Hence, due to the honor of the Lord regarding her, we certainly know what abundance of graces in every mode was conferred upon her for the sake of sin to be conquered. She merited to conceive and bear him who most certainly had no sin. So, Augustine affirmed in De Natura et Gratia that Mary was exempt from any discussion of actual sin in the same vein as the citation before. Mary's capacity to merit at the Incarnation presupposed some sort of prevenient grace. The rationale for Mary's all-holiness seems to derive from her pious faith and lack of concupiscence. Augustine's Contra Julianum, which he wrote in 422, and his Opus Imperfectum, 428, assure us of Augustine's Greek sources. Augustine notably claimed to repeat only his Greek predecessors. In Fellner's concise comments on the matter, Augustine failed in his traducianism to smooth out his anti-Pelagian thrust with his own Marian predestination. Fellner's points, points to a passage, which he wrote in 410, of Augustine, which predated the Pelagian crisis, and that is 10c. Before he was born of her, he had known his mother in her predestination, and before God himself was creating, he had known his mother, from whom, as man himself, he was created. Whatever the propitious components that are li likewise scattered throughout the copious works of Augustine, a synthetic doctrine of Mary's holiness seems to have escaped the Dr. Grazie. Part 4, the Prepurified Virgin of Lateran Council 649 and Maximus the Confessor. Two centuries post-mortem, but continuing, continuing an Augustinian thread, Maximus the Confessor's The Life of the Virgin, which was perhaps written in, from six, anywhere from 626, I would argue 634, appears to be the first Greek source directly repeating Augustine's triple virginity formula. Namely, Mary was a virgin before, during, and after conception. Let's go to number 11. There is no pain of childbirth. For truly, she alone is a virgin exalted above all virgins, a virgin ever immaculate, before birth, in birth, and after birth. He adopted this, I argue, from St. Augustine. It doesn't exist in Byzantine theology before, so he likely got this in North Africa because his father in the faith also strangely repeats the same thing, and he was also living with him in North Africa. Um, what we see here is Maximus certainly would have encountered uh, something of Augustine in Africa, as scholars suppose, we have no proof until, except for this perhaps passage, that uh, he actually repeats Augustine. But he also would have uh, encountered Augustinian Florilegia, which have been um, shown to have existed at Lateran Council 649. So if he didn't have the chance, for some reason, uh, 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 in North Africa, he certainly had the chance at Lateran Council 649. Maximus's ante antecedent prior to Lateran the life of the virgin ominously all, uh, took unusual Byzantine interest in original sin as well. Very strange uh, interest in original sin, also suggesting North African influence. Still, Maximus avoided traducianism and ancestral guilt, preferring only to speak of an extrinsic ancestral curse in his doctrine of original sin. Maximus' disciple Theodore of Tarsus, known as St. Theodore of Canterbury to us, was doubtless present at Lateran 649 as well. 
There is no doubt that Maximus served as the template, if not the author, for the doctrines of Lateran 649. The pre-purified virgin likely spread from Rome into Spain and England in succeeding decades because of this propitious synod. Perhaps Maximus and his African companions, because of their commentary on this idea of pre-purification, actually began substituting the term immaculate, as we see in the quotation that we just read, for the traditional term pre-purified at the inception of monoenergism's official beginnings. For example, Maximus's father and teacher, Sophronius of Jerusalem, taught about the pre-purified virgin. We just read him speaking about the pre-purified. If you look at number three, Nobody is as pre-purified as you, for the Holy Spirit comes down upon you, and the stainless woman, she's already stainless, uh, the Spirit is going to make you more pure. That's what pre-purification is, a totally pure nature being made somehow more holy. So Sophronius is Maximus's father and teacher. Sophronius cited the, also this very same pithy triple virginity formula after his time in Africa. And uh, he did so, uh, as you can see, Number 3b, this is a synodical epistle against monothelitism. God accomplished the conception without seed, the uncorruptive birth, the undefiled immaculate virginity, which was intact before the birth and during the birth and after the birth. So what we see here is the same promoter of the prepurified is also under the influence of Augustine in Africa. Sophronius lauded Mar uh, Mary's purification at the Annunciation as the moment when a totally spotless nature was made somehow holier, unless or until the Georgian version of Maximus's The Life of the Virgin is reconstructed into Greek or less likely rediscovered. The Georgian version, which calls the triple Virgin Mary immaculate, might either be a case of translating, as did Rufinus, pre-purified as immaculate, or it might be a case where Maximus simply himself replaced the term pre-purified with, like uh, Rufinus, the word immaculate. I suspect that Maximus's original term uh, in the life of the Virgin uh, was, in fact, pre-purified since the Sixth Ecumenical Council uh, canonized and employed Maximus's theology, whereat Emperor Constantine IV says, and if we go to number four, number four, I'm going to read his profession of faith, we confess the only begotten Son who emptied himself in the, in the womb of the spotless virgin and Theotokos Mary, after she was pre-purified in body and soul via the Holy Spirit and from her holy and blameless flesh. So you see pre-purification is present in a context which is pro-Maximian. It's not a proof, but it's somewhat circumstantial that this is part and parcel apparently in this, in this council. A afterwards, Theodore of Tarsus remained in Rome, that is, Maximus' disciple. Under the aegis of Maximus' disciple, the pre-purified virgin made her way to England. For Theodore, or at least his scholars, cited Maximus in their English biblical commentaries of Canterbury. I realize that that's only circumstantial. Theodore possessed not only Maximus' Lateran Mariology, uh, the full acta of which were available in England even to bead the venerable, but another Nazian Zeno Mariological source as well. Theodore incubated first Maximus's notion of Mary's pre-purification, likely in the hotbed of theological activity within Orthodox Rome for the Greek and Syrian monasteries filled with political and religious refugees of the East. Maximus had bequeathed them Nazianzen's doctrine of the purified Jesus and Mary, not just in the life of the Virgin, but the purified Jesus is also in um, another one of his works. I think it's the Ambigua. Maximus handed on Nazianzen's doctrine that Jesus was purified, albeit free from sin. Theodore likely knew also Gregory's Na Gregory Nazianzen's theophany or oration directly. This is from secondary literature uh, and his own site uh, and his own mention of uh, Nazianzen in, in what is attributed to him in his biblical commentaries. Consequently, good reasons exist for circumstantially believing that Theodore held the doctrine of the purified Jesus and Mary. But now the proof. Theodore, if you go to, uh, to number 13, please. Number 13. 
Theodore, or at least his monastic team, brought to England Ephraim the Syrian, as well as someone, a, tri uh, a pseudepigraphist writer called Ephraim the Syrian, not always pseudepigraphist, but in many cases, uh, called Ephraim Grecus. Ephraim Grecus. Ephraim's 5th century adversus hereticos completely vindicates my claim that the pre-purified virgin was known as a source for theological reflection in medieval English Christianity. In the sermon selection that you see in number 13, footnote 20, uh, in this sermon, in Latin, the author took up the theme of Nazianzen's purified Theotokos at the Annunciation. We're not going to read the Latin because that excerpt doesn't contain the important passage. It just proves that the sermon was in England and that it was translated at least partially. But he read Greek anyway, so if he had access to the sermon, it's entirely possible that he read the whole thing. Well, let's go to number 13, not the footnote, and I'll read the, uh, the bold areas. Shellfish are the creeping creatures in the waters. The pearl is from unclean animals, seeing too that Christ was begotten nature, which had been befouled and eager for purification through the visitation of God. Just as lightning to everything, in this way does Christ purify things of nature. For this reason did he also cleanse the virgin, and in this manner was he begotten, in order to show that wherever Christ is, all purity operates. He, having made a preparation, purified her in the Holy Spirit, and in this manner does the womb, having become pure, conceive. He purified her in her purity, wherefore was he also begotten, having left her a virgin. The author initially can be suspected of affirming a tainted nature, uh, or affirms tainted nature which might risk in infecting Mary. But Mary provides a connection between Jesus and Adamite flesh, hence the reason for emphasizing the fallen nature uh, and Christ's connection to it. Mary's purification at the Annunciation, at the uh, Incarnation event, happens here, though, in a very Byzantine manner. Namely, Mary is purified as one already in holiness, in hag agnia. Ephraim employs the motif of virginity as the entire Greek tradition of pre-purification considered virginity the co-natural symbol of interior purity. Her virginal flesh is somehow connected to Adam in lineage, but is otherworldly in its peculiar disposition to bear the incarnate word. Hence, Mary possesses flesh that is contradictory pre-lapsarian and post-lapsarian. Ephraim is more metaphorical than his Greek predecessors and successors, but repeats their theological dicta exactly. A substantial excerpt from the sermon was translated into Latin in Theodore's biblical commentary. Number five, the pre-purified virgin in Anglo-Saxon England. Venerable Bede, who died in 735, was not merely aware of Theodore, his school, and his theology, but Bede cited Theodore directly at least one time. I would argue that a similar occurrence happens in Bede through incorporating Byzantine purification of Mary into his own works. Theodore of Tarsus trained Bede's ordaining bishop, a propitious connection. Bede was aware of living Greek scholarship among Anglo-Saxon clergy and religious, where a full-fledged Greco-Latin school of theology and arts existed up to his own day. Bede not only knew Latin, but was versed in Greek among other literate languages. Bede says, in his sermon on the Annunciation, if you go to number 14, please. The Holy Spirit, while descending into the Virgin in two modes, manifests in her the efficaciousness of His divine power, for He certainly purified the mind of that famous maiden from every uncleanness of vice, as much as human fragility allowed it, so that she would be worthy for heavenly birth. Also, He created a holy and venerable body of our Redeemer, through his operation alone in the womb of that maiden, i.e., there was no intervention of manly touch. He formed his own flesh from the sacrosanct and violet flesh of the Virgin. Now the power of the Most High overshadowed the Blessed Virgin of Mary of God because the Holy Spirit, when he filled her heart, he tempered it from every ardor of carnal concupiscence. He cleansed it from temporal desires, and he simultaneously consecrated her mind and her body with heavenly gifts. Though he never attributes sin to Mary, this, is, this passage has always confused scholars because it seems to speak for us with the lexical definition of purification as ethical. It's not ethical, it's Byzantine. It's Christological purification and Mariological purification. It's an all-pure nature having grace added to it. You'll notice that there's a double uh, purification. Nazianzen 
only mentions she was pre-purified in soul and body. Uh, this gets changed into Damascene and others as a sanctification of mind, a purification of body. You'll see these combinations. They're very Byzantine, this expansion of, 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 of the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. well, why do you uh, put the surname of Papadogia Greco? Uh, I don't know. It's probably a... Uh, Latina. Latina. Yes, it's, it's, it's there. I, I, I quickly slap these together, so for, <laughs> forgive some of the errors. The, the author initially infirm, affirms the tainted nature of the abstract human nature. Mary provides a connection between Jesus and Adamite flesh. Mary's purification at the Annunciation happens in a Byzantine manner. Oops, I'm reading the wrong thing. At first glance, Bede echoes um, Augustinian vocabulary, the f familiar mundare at the Annunciation, of Marian purification. But Bede, too, was aware of the controversies surrounding Augustine and original sin. For he had read an official epistle from Pope Honorius to the Irish, wherein Honorius employed Psalm 50 or 51 as proof text, I was conceived in sin, my, and my mother uh, bore me in sin, as a proof text for fetal transmission of original sin. Here, context suggests that Bede inherited the Lateran and Maximian tradition because Bede treats Honorius honorably. He strangely holds for a respective pu uh, purification for Mary's mind and body, a peculiarly Byzantine phraseology found in formulas of Marian pur purification in the Emperor Justinian. So if we go back to the front, Justinian uh, expanded uh, pur pre-purification while Jesus cleanses me, number two, while Jesus cleanses me, what is similar is mixed with what is similar. And in all points, he has become man without sin. Though having been conceived from a virgin after she herself was pre-purified with respect to body and soul through the Spirit, for it was necessary that childbirth be honored and virginity be greatly honored prior to that. Also Constantinople III, which we've already read, and John Damascene, which we've already read. Bede's uncanny use of this terminology hints at Theodore's school. Bede could be Augustinian with his mundare, but not with his castificare for Mary's Annunciation. Bede's exegesis is not absolutely forthright. It is possible to read into this slightly cryptic exegesis a kind of cleansing from actual mental lust for things of the flesh, a bizarre position for this time and place. More plausibly, Bede means that Mary was fortified in virtue for the realization of her vocation to undergo none of the passions associated with conception and sexual intercourse. Parsimony strongly suggests that the Byzantine optic is operative here or that it tempers Augustine's prior and somewhat negative implication of soiled flesh in the virgin. Given influence of Bede upon Pascasius Radbertus, who died around 865, he serves as the synthetic figure between Augustine and Nazi and Zeno originate pre-purification in the Middle Ages. Pascasius formally perplexed scholars, for he explicitly exempts Mary in utero from Augustinian original sin, while yet simultaneously holding for the doctrine of Mary's purification at the Annunciation. It was a big question mark for scholars. Scholars have attempted to solve Pascasius' unse un unseemly inconsistency by a logical but ad hoc solution, namely that the uncleanness at, at the birthing process, according to the old law, accounted for the contradiction of being... Are we all running over? Okay, then we can finish up. So we'll end with Pascasius, and we're finished. We don't, I'll let you read the other ones. Um, Let's go to the second citation of Pascasius, and we can end there. Where is he at? Thank you. We'll just read the... Uh-oh, I don't have page five. Thank you. I beseech thee, let these infinitist men cease to speak in such a way that Jesus was born as other infants were born, since the Virgin Mother of God did not bear him out of the origin of the first pre-verification in order to be reborn, but from the Holy Spirit, without pain and groaning, without annoyance and bitterness, without sorrow and affliction, since all these are most justly the damned and vindictive retributions of the flesh in the first origin. What is more, Blessed Mary, although she was born and procreated from the flesh of sin, that's that Augustinian terminology we just saw, Although she was of sin from the point and the conceptive moment, she was not so at the time when she is called blessed by the angel, since there was the prevenient grace foregone by all women of the Holy Spirit. 
Luke says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. If she is not sanctified and cleansed in some other way through the same Holy Spirit, in what way is his flesh not flesh of sin? If too his flesh comes from the mass of the first prevarication, in what manner was Christ, the Word, made flesh without sin? Did he assume flesh from flesh of sin? And here's his response. Unless first the Word overshadowed her because he was made flesh, whom did the Holy Spirit overcome and the power of the Most High totally possess? Wherefore, truly the flesh was not at that same instant flesh of sin in her whom God completely diffused himself. And the Word who was made flesh without sin came to us. He, by right, not alone, did he not retain the law of vitiated nature and birthing, nor the law of first origin which women possessed. If indeed his mother had conserved the commandment of all things, as if an Eve in paradise. At a prior time, in a like in a manner unlike the Holy Spirit filling her at the Annunciation, she was without original sin, whose glorious birth is especially lauded in every church. Yet indeed, if she were not blessed and glorious, her feast would not be celebrated everywhere by all. Yet because it is observed so solemnly, it is established from the authority of the church that in no ways at, at, that, at the time that she was born did she come under, the tran, under transgressions, and neither when she was sanctified in utero did she contract original sin. And so you'll see that that is opposite of the purification of Mary, which is up in the prior passage. So in conclusion, I think what I've tried to trace for you is what I would like to think, and at least I'm comfortable with it because Father Peter is comfortable with it, uh, is uh, what might be uh, the Western version of the Byzantine doctrine of what I would call the Immaculate Conception. So what you've given us is an absolute marvelous study of text, context, textual warrant. And that's what uh, Father Lewis was telling us that we've learned from Father Peter. We know that from our experience. So thank you for that. And Father Peter, would you like to comment to Father Chris? Yeah. I'm in agreement. I, I don't know. I, I don't think I can add, but I could, we could go into the other aspects of the connection with the, with the, with the, with the West. Uh, at the time of the Council of Florence, which I think is a very important, important point in the intimate relations between the Franciscans there, there and the, the Greek, Greek members of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Council, and then the friction between the Franciscan Greeks, Greeks and the Dominican representatives, especially uh, Torquemada. The uh, famous decree for the Armenians, which was uh, an attempt, as it were, to to arrive at a con condemnation of the Palamites and the Scotus together. They were considered to be be one and the same heresy, hmm. which ends up getting picked up in the Manualist tradition afterwards. Hmm. Palamites and Scotus are considered two sides of the That is a, a correct analysis that, of course, the ecumenical potential, potential of devotion to Our Lady is tremendous, particularly to the Immaculate Conception. Okay, well... Could either of you say a word about Gregory Palamas? Because obviously, uh, Thomas have been attacking him for ages. Um, he is beginning to be recognized in Catholic spirituality more and more, I think. Mm -hmm. um, seems to me that Benedict XVI cited him on more than one occasion, yeah. and perhaps John Paul II. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Festigi provided me with the citation in the book here of John Paul II. Uh, yes, yeah, it, was, it was in November. 1979, he gave a, an, a homily in Ephesus, uh. and he referred to him as Saint Gregoire uh, Alama. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. then when it was put in the um, Insegnamenti, in, in, in it was changed to Vescovo Ortodoxo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then when it was put in the Acta Apostolici Sedis, it was Levet Orthodox. Uh, so that someone was doing a little changing, but I'm quite sure that, originally that, he, that he said it because in, in the immediate English translation of the Lozovitor Romano, it was Saint Gregory Palamas. I, I did go to the editions that you suggested, and you were right. It was Saint initially. It was Saint initially. H here, here's the citation. 
from St. John Paul II, uh, Eastern theology has laid great deal of emphasis on the catharsis or, or purification that Mary underwent at the moment of the Annunciation. It will be enough for us to recall here the moving commentary of St. Gregory Palamas on this point in one of his homilies. Quote, you are already holy and full of grace, O Virgin, says the angel to Mary, but the Holy Spirit will come upon you anew and prepare you for the divine mystery by an increase of grace, end quote. Oh,